Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. Since I am such a midget, I'd be a talking head if I stayed up here, so I'm going to come down and talk to everyone here. Uh, thank you so much, Ian, for inviting me. It's a beautiful resort, and uh, thank you for coming back. I appreciate you taking the time to come listen to me and not enjoy the outdoors and the travel crazy that's been going on. Um, I was uh, giving Dr. Caulfield a hard, hard time, and I said I had to move heaven and earth to get here, and I'm honored and blessed to be here. So I had the opportunity to just uh, listen to the speakers this morning and not yesterday, couldn't make it in time. Um, and it's really interesting. I think if I were to leave you with anything is, if I'm good at one thing, is to make you think and wonder. I have a very different perspective. I started in academic sleep medicine and set up a sleep program in Edmonton, Alberta, and I left because I was uh, just telling one of the attendees here that uh, it got to the point where I thought, wow, I could CPAP the mom, the dad, the cat, the dog, the whatever, and the BMI is just getting bigger. I'm like, there's got to be a different way. So now I'm in the community, and uh, I'm looking for different hacks and different opportunities and different things to make things better. And it is a good time. Um, like the speaker just before said, this is the best time of history life that we could be in in terms of how fast things move, how much better our life is, how convenient things are. And in terms of the cusp of sleep medicine, this is it. You folks are in the pioneering part of changing the world. So uh, embrace the things that are to come. And this is an opportunity to change and make things better. So what I wanted to do is talk about the pathophysiology of sleep apnea in relation to the limitations of AHI. Unfortunately, we've kind of hung ourselves. I, not just that, it's actually changed how I even think about medicine and practice, and I'll talk about some of that. And it's important to address the entire airway. So um, when we think about a house and the foundation of a house, you want to think about the land that the house that you're going to build it on. You're not going to build it in sand or swamp land or on the edge of a cliff unless you have taken engineering principles that make sure that you're addressing all of that. You're going to make sure your scaffolding is appropriate and you're going to pick the resources and materials to, pick, to make your house be okay. Right? So when you think of that in that way, from the airway, from birth to cradle to grave, um, it's not just about the little pinpoint things we know. Um, it's about the human that they are and the genetic loading that they come from. So my accent is Canadian, but I was born in Africa. So I have generations of African and Indian heritage. So there's things about me that, you know, if there is Darwin and survival of the fittest, there's things that belong to just me. So if I, you know, emigrate to another part of the world and I change my diet and I change how I eat and I change what I do, how is that supposed to work for me if I wasn't designed to be there? And now we're a global economy. So you can see how environment, if you build a house that is in Queensland, if you've ever been to Australia, on stilts, that wouldn't work very well in northern Alberta. That would be really tough, right? But we don't think about those things, and we're not taught to think about those things, either as you as dentists or me as a doctor, but it all makes a difference. And so you are integral in this, and I'll explain why. It's pretty cool, because you and I are fundamental in the well-being of the human. Um, to survive without breath, you can only last three minutes. Food and water, you got lots more time, okay? So we, the airway, this is the life force. The skin's important for protection, but this is where it's at, and it takes you and me to make sure that the structure and function is appropriate. So my only conflict is that I'm a medical advisor for Vivos, and uh, sleep image, um, he showed you the aura ring, but the sleep image is amazing if you haven't seen the technology. I know the science behind it, and I'm actually a medical advisor for them too. 
Um, I'm happy to talk to you about that if you want, and I read studies for dentists and consult with them. So basically, in everything you've heard, sleep apnea is bad, okay? The AHRQ just came out recently, and they said, well, we don't know about CPAP. Well, we don't even know if sleep apnea is a disease. What are you talking about? What happened? Anyways, doesn't matter. The science is that it's bad. If you've had sleep apnea, and whether you love your dental appliance or whether you love your CPAP or that 29-year-old young man we just saw, sleep apnea is real. If you've lived it, there's no faking it. I'm a prototype of that. I have sleep apnea, I have a horrible tongue tie, and what happened was I didn't know, and it ruined my academic life. I couldn't function, I had depression, anxiety, all those things, I was about this wide, you know, as your prototype sleep apnea patient. And I got onto CPAP and changed a bunch of things, and I'm on a journey of healing and uh, wellness that has nothing to do with some of those things, okay? And, you know, even in here, it's uh, funny after you, I talk to people and hang out with them, I can identify people at the airport. And uh, their, you know, families are, will say, what it, like, who are you? Like, how do you know that time and training and patience? So you see it every day. And the more you look for it, the more you'll see it. And once you see it, there is no stopping it. It doesn't matter what kind of dentistry you think you do. Once you see it, it's, it'll come, and it just keeps coming. I, I think the, t the most important thing is that we have to address the phenotype, okay? We, that precision medicine means something. The right patient, the right time, the right diagnosis, and the right treatment, it all means something. I, you know, the sentence when you say Johnny bit the dog or the dog bit jo Johnny means very different things. So it's a matter of doing the right thing at the right time and it'll take all of us to figure some of that out. So I, I know you wanted me to talk about adults, but I'm gonna start with this person, a 16 year old, because in that trajectory of sleep apnea, you are influenced by who, who, who we are to go to become where we are. So he's 16, so if, if I were, I, my background is in pediatrics, what opportunity did we miss for him to have a BMI of 46 at age 16? And he said, I just feel terrible and I'm failing school and I can't get up in time for school. But he sleeps in the basement and no one knows, okay? And I looked at his airway and I said, holy God, that is brutal. How can you even breathe? You're breathing through like a straw that big. And as much as I thought, oh, the weight's a problem and he has sleep apnea. I don't have some of those cool toys. All I did was say, oh my God. I said, look in the mirror. There's a mirror in my examination room. I said, open your mouth and look up. I said, I'm two feet shorter than you. And my airway up here, my jaw, upper jaw, does not look like that. My jaw fits that much more room and space than yours does. It's not supposed to look like that. Your garage, as Tam says, should not fit a smart car. It's supposed to fit two Cadillacs, okay? It's pretty simple. Even a kid gets that. A mom gets that, a dad gets that. It's like, this doesn't work for you. No wonder you have depression and anxiety and bipolar and God knows what else. How can you not? No fuel, no power, no gas, no success. When you live at the brainstem of your brain, there's no way you can get to the penthouse. Not a chance, okay? So, so with him, it's not just what we see. Like, that's pretty obvious. You know, anybody can see that. It's like, wow, what am I going to do and what am I going to tackle first and how, okay? Because I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, okay, you're pre-diabetic. Uh, you have a big liver. Uh, you probably have high blood pressure. Like, what am I gonna address and how am I gonna address that in what context? Oh, and then there's a depression and ADHD and a bunch of other things. I've had adolescents like that. I'm the Hail Mary for the psychiatrist for an adolescent that has refractory depression at age 13, okay? Suicidal despite 60 milligrams of Prozac. You look at her, her jaw's back here. She has horrific asthma and celiac disease. 
How are we ever going to treat just the depression with a pill if I don't manage her airway? But you see that every day. Other people don't see what you see. Okay, so what is it that we have to address? If I were to go back and look at sleep medicine, it reminds me of this Indian story, a story of the six blind men and the elephant. It depends on who you're talking about. Someone thinks it's a tail and that's all they see. Someone thinks the trunk is a wall and that's all they see. A fan, a tree, um, a, the tusk, and a snake being the trunk. Okay, we're all gonna do very different things. We're gonna call it different things. Our mandate of what it is is gonna be different things. So it's kind of cool that it's the elephant. Uh, Garth Brooks says uh, in his documentary, he talked about a blessing and a curse. I'm gonna change that a little bit. I'm gonna say it's a blessing and a burden. So it's pretty cool that you know all the stuff you do, but it's a little bit of a burden because it's overwhelming sometimes. In your practice, when you're trying to make a buck and get stuff done in this moment, and you see someone like that, you're like, oh, that's, it's a burden. It is a blessing. It's pretty cool to help people, but this is a burden too. It's a labor of love. It, it, it's long and it's hard sometimes because it's not that pretty and obvious. Okay? So the good news is that we're, it's the tusk. So not very many animals have a tusk and the trunk. These are really important parts of the elephant. And that's where you and I come in. Okay, and just like the speaker before said, the reason CPAP doesn't work, it's because it's the, not the right thing for, every, for everybody. I love my CPAP. I couldn't imagine being without it. Okay, and I've even had kids as little as three or four say, I want that. Okay, I had a 17-year-old who was failing school. I'm a sleep doctor. He was diagnosed with Klein-Levine syndrome and we were just talking with Dr. Cofield about this. He is really flexible. He's on this many psychiatric medications, and I diagnosed him with asthma, because remember I said airway trumps everything else, and I said, just do me a favor. Humor me, just start CPAP, because he, he couldn't get out of bed. We put him on CPAP and put him on puffers and improved some things. He graduated grade 12 after almost failing before Christmas with his marks in the 70s. And he was wicked funny, because now he could come to the penthouse of his brain. And he loved his CPAP so much that after school sometimes, while reading a book or hanging out, he'd put a CPAP on because it supported his airway and he felt so good. Huh, imagine that. So we don't know what we don't know. So this goes back. I might. I'm talking so much that I might not finish my talk, but you've heard some of this from other speakers. I want to make it impactful and meaningful for you to take what you have learned yesterday and today, to take it home, embody it, and use it. Okay, so, I, uh, so the bottom line is the airway, size, function, shape of it is critical, breath, how fast or how you move air, and if you get it to where it needs to go, um, and sleep, because when someone doesn't sleep, it actually causes sleep apnea. In babies that are deprived by an hour nap, one hour nap, it increases their apnea index from one or less than one, which is normal, to over six from a one hour nap, okay? You take a middle schooler, who's sleep deprived by one hour a day for seven days, one out of three are positive for ADHD. You get a child to sleep less than 10 hours a night, the risk of obesity is exponential. You take an adult who sleeps five hours, a man who sleeps five hours a night, it prematurely ages him by 10 years, hormonally, with testosterone. So how many people that take, Vi how many men that take Viagra actually really have OSA that we don't even know about? It's everywhere. You cannot close your eyes to that once you hear it and see it, okay? Sleep is critical because it is in sleep where you heal. It's in sleep where you get the opportunity to get rid of waste. It's in sleep where the brain, the 
veins in the brain become venules to get rid of toxins. So uh, interesting, the estimated burden based on a study in 2019 uh, in Lancet said that the burden is, I think it's almost a billion people now. A billion people have sleep apnea. Billion people. I don't know how many sleep doctors there are, but I know there's not enough. I don't know how many dentists there are, but I know there's not enough. You could keep working till your last breath and there'll still be more. And this here, this is based on what we think we know, sleep apnea. But look at what we eat and look at how our society is going. We spend eight hours a day sitting at a desk. Our DNA isn't designed for that. Breath and movement. Standing water breeds bugs. We're supposed to move and breathe, but we don't do it properly. So I think it's not a billion, it's way more if we keep going as we are. My humble opinion. When we look at costs, this is in 2015, the data is old, 162 billion uh, per patient diagnosis and treatment, 67% less when they're, when then leaving them undiagnosed. But look at how much we're treating. Look at how many people we're treating. Increase it tenfold, a hundredfold. Have a co colleague in Alberta. And, uh, you know, he said, oh, you know, we don't have enough uh, sleep beds. I said, I'll give you 10 more. I'll give you 50 more. It won't be enough. There's no way. There's one time I was like, you know what? We should have, like, CPAP come down, positive pressure come down. We should just all hang out and just put it on our faces. Um, so it's really common. This is, again, from uh, the AASM. Look, look at how many people are involved to diagnose sleep apnea. I can tell you that my best referrals now come from dentists. They're smart. They see and know things that my pediatrician colleagues or family doctors don't know. They're really great. They ask good questions, and we trade pa uh, patients back and forth. We pitch and catch and say, I tried this already. What are you going to do? You, you try this already and it's not working. It's a united airway. When this doesn't work, this doesn't work very well either. Your complex sleep apnea or the ones that have COPD. When the lungs aren't good, physics, okay? When the lungs aren't good, this is gonna collapse. It's physics, way before you and I came along. When this is small, this can't get support. So because I see kids and adults, I don't know which came first, chicken or egg. Is it that your tongue is tied and this is small and it makes this have asthma and allergies and all of that? Or is it that you already have that tendency for asthma and allergies and that's what we call adenoidal facies? I'm not sure. I think it's bidirectional and I'm not sure what, where that starts. And then what are you going to treat? What are you going to focus on? Remember we talked about patients as opposed to AHI. I don't really care about the AHI if you have life failure. Do you really care about the AHI if the bus driver ran, into, ran the bus off and killed a bunch of people? Does it matter what his AHI was? No. If the person had a stroke and has AFib, does it matter what the AHI was? There's already end organ dysfunction. And what are you going to treat? What are you going to treat? Are you going to make the spouse happy? going to address the accidents, what, what's, what's, what are, what's the goal? Because you've seen this too. You've seen people with the AHI of 100 and you call them and say, hey, John, you have really bad sleep apnea. And they look at you and say, what are you talking about? I feel great. You're annoying me. I don't want CPAP or your appliance. Okay. Then there's the others where the AHI is four. And you're like, you don't have sleep apnea. And the man or woman, typically woman, says, are you sure that's right? Because I sure feel terrible. So what is that? Because that person doesn't feel well. Something's not right. What is it? So I want to spend a couple minutes going through this because when you un understand this, it'll be so clear in terms of sleep apnea. Okay, I hope. So when we talk about the whole sleep-wake continuum, if you wake too much, that's called insomnia. Pretty simple. Okay, 
all these things in some ex to some extent is a symptom. It's not really a disorder. We call it a disorder, but I'm not sure it is in the way it's, we think it is, okay? Because even insomnia, we give it a pill or we give people with insomnia a pill, but that's not the answer because what's the root cause, okay? So if you're too awake, we call it insomnia or in, uh, awake at an inappropriate time, we call it insomnia. But remember, I just told you the airway is critical. So anyone that has maintenance insomnia, so not even sleep onset difficulty sometime, but definitely maintenance insomnia, waking up anywhere between whatever, 11, 12 at night till 3, 4 in the morning, their airway doesn't work. Their airway doesn't work. You can, you can give them melatonin, you can give them all these sleeping pills, but someone should check for sleep apnea. Their airway does not support them properly. Okay, insomnia. If you have sleepiness and you're way too sleepy, that's called hypersomnia. Easy, you're too awake or too asleep. If that is misaligned with the clock, that's easy, it's called circadian rhythm. Shift work, jet lag, whatever. So you don't sleep or awake in the way you should at the time appropriately. Pretty simple, circadian problem, okay? So if you're too awake, then you should be insomnia. If you're too sleepy, then that's hypersomnia. So narcolepsy, whatever. However, the driving things that push you to have insomnia or hypersomnia, sleep apnea, airway is always central. And when the airway uh, struggles to do what it's supposed to, you get disorders of arousal or movement, like REM behavior, an older person, um, nightmares, night terror, sleepwalking, and that is all influenced or made worse by shift in circadian rhythm. Pretty easy. Pretty easy, there are 68 sleep disorders, but this is the foundation of it all. Okay? Um, so, there's all these sleep disorders. It's hard to remember it this way, but if you just remember it in the other slide that I showed you, okay? Not one of them is exempt from airway structure and function, in my humble opinion. I've given pills and I've treated this with that and whatever, it still comes back to airway. So I need you or I need well, me or my other colleagues, the ENT surgeon or the allergist or whatever. Um, it's still airway and inflammation. Okay, sorry, this got messed up because it's math. Okay, so what, what is the goal? Well, we want to identify what it is and treat it so that you make, you help someone feel good and prevent morbidity and mortality. And based on the last few slides I showed you, how that person shows up will make a difference. The person that has been diagnosed with diabetes, they get insulin. How many, how many times do they, endocrinologists, how many endocrinologists always ask to see if sleep apnea is the root cause? Probably not everybody, based on what he said, 14 years, right? 14, 17 years, he said, for 14% to be able to do what they're supposed to. Okay, so every diabetic patient should be screened for sleep apnea. I bet you they're not. Every hypertensive patient should be screened for sleep apnea. I bet you they're not. Every patient that has drowsy driving and a near-miss accident should be screened and tested for sleep apnea. I bet you they're not. So who, who, so going back to that elephant, if we're focused on the tail, or we think it's the trunk and we're looking at the cement and thinking that it's, or a tree, we will never ever think about something else because we're, we have, um, it's called cognitive bias. We're stuck with what we know and believe what we know and that's how we think. So I've gotten three subspecialties and done all this stuff. I even learned acupuncture. After all of that, I've had to go back to the whole elephant. I have to think about the whole elephant. If I get stuck at the trunk or the tail or whatever, I'm not helping the human. I gotta put it all in context. Whether they need CPAP or your oral appliance therapy or 
even the celiac disease that's causing inflammation in their body, making their nose snotty, making their lungs not work, making their gut terrible. It's all connected. I have to go back and look at it all. And when I haven't, it doesn't work. So going to, along that vein or whatever, the, so he spoke to it this morning. What, what should we be looking at? What really matters? We don't even know that. Is it symptoms? You know, does it matter that you say that you don't feel terrible and I can't find it with my stethoscope? Well, if the, the patient should know, right, it's their body, the client, whoever, they don't feel good. I didn't find anything, but they still don't feel good. So there's something, there's something there that we're not connecting to, right? And, and they, like that boy, so if, if that, um, I don't even understand this part. There are people that are obese that don't have sleep apnea. I don't understand why. How can you have a BMI of 48, we do a PSG and, the, and there's no sleep apnea? How is that possible? I don't understand. Because obesity is a risk factor. There must be some protective thing for them. I don't get it. Okay, so then there's, um, I, I could go on and tell you a story about a family I saw yesterday. And I'm like, I'm not sure. I have to go back and think about the pathophysiology because it can't connect the dots. So there's something, you know, we're so good at looking at the average and focusing on the average. Um, I think it's called, the book is called Outliers. We should focus on the person that, you know, George Burns, who smoked every day and drank every day and made it to 100. I want to know what he's doing. <laughs> Not that I smoke or drink, but that's pretty cool. Or, or the people that live to past 100, there's a bunch all over the world. I want to know what they do. I want to know what they do to live their best life. That is the secret. Figure out what their genes and environment are and what they do and what their teeth are like and what their airways like. That's what I want. Not this, so oh, this is where we're stuck and we're going to keep going and uh, spinning our wheels there. Uh, my humble opinion. Um, and, then, and then, you know, we're stuck on this AHI and ODI and PSG. Okay, people, it's not working. We've shown it's not working. It doesn't tell us what's wrong. In pediatrics and adults, we've shown it doesn't tell us what's wrong. It's not enough. So to me, because I'm a lung doctor, so okay, we have this patient that goes to eMERGE every three months and is in the ICU because of an asthma exacerbation. But the lung function is completely normal in between. It's not asthma. It's got to be asthma. They need asthma meds, and we give them and treat them. Yeah, but in between, the lung function is normal, so it can't be. What? OK, so this, this is part of the challenge, OK? And so, part, so when we look at the clinical symptoms and how much suffering there is, and people, you see it, upper airway resistance syndrome, or even childhood sleep apnea, the parents suffer a lot, a lot, a lot. If you're a suffering parent, or you've been a suffering parent, or a child that finally got treated, there's a lot of suffering. Who cares what the AHI and ODI is? You're failing school, suicidal, terrible. Does it really matter? So it's all nice, and it's nice to be able to measure it. But if it doesn't represent how much suffering there is, I'm not sure. To me, it's the difference between magnetic north and true north. If you're a sailor, I'm learning how to sail. It doesn't seem like that much, but that two degrees over time is the difference between going to Japan or maybe Hawaii. It's a big deal. Big deal. You wouldn't want your GPS to be that, that wrong. Um, and so as a surrogate, it's associated with cardiovascular disease, okay? So AHI is important for that. But does that mean that my chest pain doesn't matter till I, ooh, careful how I say it, 
that till there's a heart attack and the person's on the floor needing a code or needing to be coded. There's something that must have happened before the code and the heart attack. What happened to that whole journey leading up to before the, they collapsed on the floor? There was, there was some evidence of that. If you like Oprah, she says it's a whisper. The universe tells you in whispers. And if you ignore it and ignore it and ignore it, it turns into a tsunami. So do we have to wait till the tsunami before we realize it's a problem? Did that boy at 16 have to wait for a BMI of 46 and suffer that far and that long before getting help? No, not with your help, he wouldn't have. Um, and so AHI doesn't make up, that isn't associated with all these things that we value and no correlation with PSG that we think is the gold standard. So we already talked about this, that this morning, that CPAP is superior. So it is helpful for reducing AHI, normalizing oxygen, but the use is terrible. In the lab, it's beautiful, and just like he said, life, daytime stuff, not so helpful. Mandibular advancement devices are equivalent and they can be better. But apart from CPAP and MAD, should we be looking at other environmental things? Okay, it's pretty clear, energy in or energy out. That's the formula for obesity, isn't it? Don't eat, close this, close the hatch. Why is it a multi-billion dollar industry or now trillion dollar industry if the formula is that simple? You need a big airway to support you, it's that simple. Okay, but wow. So there is clearly some other things that go with it, like the complex diagram he showed us this morning. So it's beyond just energy in, energy out. There's all those other things. So when you look at the data for obesity, bariatric surgery does not reduce the AHI back to less than five. If we don't address the environment and support people to help them get back to breathing and functioning, it won't be enough and it won't help. Gotta do the inside work too, not just the outside. It's like that, I tell kids and families, moms and dads, it's like the movie Inside Out, you gotta make sure your tower's in order so you don't have to manage all these things one at a time outside. And we're important in managing that tower Super important, because if we manage that tower, you and I work together collaboratively, we're gonna prevent the diabetes and the hypertension and the heart disease and all of that, okay? Um, so we know that this stuff helps and it's important, but I don't think it's just that. And he spoke about it this morning, success versus effect. What are we talking about? We want to help people live their best life. And that involves looking at how much impairment there is, what the numbers are, just in context, okay? And as well as hypoxic burden. So if you have a patient that has an AHI of 30 and they spent 50% with SATs below 90, that's a very different person than the person with an AHI of 30 with saturations that are completely normal, right? The hypoxic burden, so prosomnus um, is the um, mandibular advancement device, more pre precision based. They're actually gonna look at hypoxic burden and the idea is to even treat severe obstructive sleep apnea with an MAD. So if you treat that and there's no lower airway disease, then a MAD may be appropriate. My uh, you know, my colleagues sometimes kind of get upset because I read studies for them and I say CPAP is indicated. And they're like, you know, why do you always say that? Because if there's hypoxia involved, I want to make sure that we have tried it. Now I'd even be willing to say, just try CPAP for two weeks. I just want to know with a repeat study if that's the answer or not. Because if I treat them with CPAP and their sleep study is way better, I know it's a matter of a, that they need a bigger open airway. 
whether that involves you working with me or Vivos and expanding the palate, upper palate, lower palate, whatever that is, MMA, whatever you need to do, we know that the airway needs to be bigger. It's useful just to even know that. Okay, sometimes with some of this stuff, I even tell families, I know what normal vision is, I know what normal hearing is, I have no idea what normal lung function is. We have parameters for norms, but they might not be um, appropriate for kids in how much bigger they are compared to 30, 40 years ago. And I don't know what your best airway size is for you. Maybe you know that, but when I see them, I don't. Or how much or how much room there should be in the context of their ethnicity and weight and mass and collapsibility and all those things. I don't know what your best airway is for you. Um, and then we talked about efficacy versus effectiveness. So it's not the same thing. Efficacy is that CPAP works. And CPAP is better for AHI, as he told you this morning and showed you. But for effectiveness, MAD is equal. And the MAD may be perfect as long as it's doing all the things that it needs to. That's great. It's, so even now that I've been working with Vivos, my dental colleagues, I'm more likely to try it. I'm, I'm more likely to suggest it. In fact, whether it's Excite or Bongo or all these things, um, I put it in context. So I had a mom yesterday. Um, she said, you know, I got my tongue tie clipped when I was little, and, all the, and my sisters all did too. There's four sisters. They all need speech therapy. And it's interesting. It's a very interesting story, and I'd love to speak to some of you about this. The son got his tongue tie clipped, and he has speech troubles and has speech troubles all along, and he's nine and still struggling. The sister didn't have her tongue tie clipped, twin, and she snores and has more overt symptoms of sleep apnea, whereas the boy doesn't snore, okay? And the dad hasn't had his tongue tie clipped or whatever, and he snores as ha and has symptoms of sleep apnea, but the boy and the mom that had their tongue tie clipped, they have ongoing speech troubles, but they don't snore at all. Interesting. But what's interesting about the boy and the mom is they're hypermobile. They're really bendy. So there's another factor in the scaffolding. Not, our, not only are we talking about the foundation of the house and the rest of the house, now we're talking about the connective tissue being a bit wobbly. So in children with Prader-Willi or low tone, if we remove the tonsils that keep the palate up, gravity spares no one. So if we take the tonsils out, how many people have a melon patty four over time where it would have been a one if the tonsils hadn't come out? What? It's an interesting question. With, by taking out all the tonsils and adenoids, have we made everyone's palate drop and made it worse? I know some people needed them and you wouldn't have had a choice, but I'm not sure. Um, and to me, if I were to go back and look, the way I look at things is that when people say, could I have sleep apnea or do I have trouble? Fantastic five, you have to sleep well. So if your sleep doesn't feel restorative, you sleep too much, remember I showed you that diagram, too much hypersomnia or too little insomnia, then something's wrong. Breathing. If you breathe too hard and fast, so COPD, asthma, whatever, or your hypoventilator, obesity hypoventilator, it's not working. If you eat too much or you can't eat at all, something's not working. Development, so I had a family, uh, I told you I see adults and kids, so the, they, they brought the child to me because of insomnia. And uh, he is six years old, the dad is six foot eight. The, man, the mom is six feet tall. How tall should that boy be? Very tall. He should be the tallest kid in his class. 
he was at the 25th percentile. I said, your son has failure to thrive. They said, oh no, he's doing okay. I'm like, he is your son, right, for real? Not adopted? Gotta ask. I said, look at you, look at him. He has failure to thrive. You have, we have to put it in context, okay? Me too, I have failure to thrive because I'm shorter than my mom and dad. I have a bad tongue tie and sleep apnea probably forever. So our kids, if you compare it to the 1930s in Holland, I'm just making sure I'm not going over. If you compare it to the 1930s in Holland, people in Holland are 20 centimeters taller than they used to be, 20 centimeters. So we should be comparable to Holland if, if our children aren't way, way taller than we are, they have growth failure. Does that make sense? It's pretty simple. These, these, are, these are, I call it footpath medicine. These are easy things you can do in the office. You don't have to wait hours or waste hours. So the, that, that boy had uh, come to see me for insomnia and he has uh, allergies and a bunch of other things that we had to investigate him for. So the growth failure is systemic inflammation. Just missed. And, um, and sometimes what happens is, I'm seeing this more and more and you read about it. This was even 15 years ago, we talked about how psychiatrists were medicating children for insomnia, but it's not, or ADHD or even now autism. Is it really autism or is there more? Because I'd be autistic too if I can't breathe and function. It's contextual. You can't communicate and I'm socially unable to function in life. So it's important to consider. Um, we talk, so we talked about feeding and growth in context. And finally, executive function. It's impossible to come to the penthouse of your brain if you don't sleep well. Right? Even us, think about um, you know, being woken up repetitively because of the cat, the dog, or the child. It's very hard to show up at work and be that efficient. It's the same for everybody. You can't function like that. So way back in the day before my insomnia showed up that way or sleep apnea showed up that way, I'd just get up in the middle of the night, it's two in the morning, I'm like, may as well go to work. I'll teach the text some stuff and get some stuff done. I did that for years till it really affected my career. Depression, anxiety, they're like, you're, yeah, always grumpy, angry, angry. Your colleagues that are super angry around you and they're hard to be around, should screen them for sleep apnea. <laughs> um, so we, we talked about that. Just globally, it's a matter of structure and function and balancing that. So if, you, if the airway size is small and it's not collapsible, that might be okay. Think about a paper straw at Tim's, for example. This is what I tell families. Um, the paper straw has structure and support because of the plastic straw. If you take the plastic straw out, the paper straw is collapsible. Okay? And the smaller or the variability is dependent on how collapsible that is. And that, that's what makes all of this so difficult is that it's a balancing act and we can't tell. It's a state dependent sleep problem. Okay? And that maintenance insomnia, that's why we're talking about the whole phenotype of OSA. It's balancing all these things. Um, other things make a difference. Uh, sleep duration, I kind of alluded to that already. Uh, sleep robbers being sleep deprived and circadian rhythm things. All these things add burden uh, because it makes other parts of the body not work as well. Um, even, even vitamin D, for example, 
Uh, if you look at the literature for vitamin D and chronic disease and sleep, it's crazy. Everyone north of Atlanta is vitamin D deficient. How much less chronic disease would we have if everyone took enough vitamin D? And then you'd know the dental effects of vitamin D deficiency besides just the bone loss. What more or how else does it contribute? I'm just going to breeze forward. So it comes in all shapes and sizes uh, in terms of sleep apnea or what we see. Sorry. Um, I love this study. This is, uh, you know, uh, in uh, Saskatchewan. Look, two simple questions. You can get your staff to ask that. Does your bed partner ever poke or elbow you because you're snoring? Odds ratio 3.9. Even before you test. Even before the stop bang. So easy. Does your bed partner ever poke or elbow you because you've stopped breathing? Awaken for apnea is 5.8. Very simple. Easy questions. You already know they have OSA. You've done half the work already. Then you can use that to triage your screening and treatment or whatever you want. Okay? Uh, it was 128 patients um, and uh, um, look to, looking at age, sex, BMI, Epworth, all that. So people over 50, they had less positive elbow sign and lower odds ratio with OSA or being <coughs> awakened. Um, you know why? Because they're probably sleeping alone. That's why, that's why I don't think they found the answer. Because it'd be like, you know what? You, the, the snoring's so bad, either I'm going to divorce you or kill you. So, or, so just, you know, got to go sleep in the other room. Right? Sensitivity and specificity is 65%, but look at the positive predictive value. And then men with a BMI of over 31, specificity of 96%. So not good for women. This isn't good for women as much, but it's really helpful for men. Super easy to do. Um, I call it the rule of thirds. Look, I'm not a dentist, and you know this way better than I, but that when I look at a face, I say, okay, symmetry. Top third, middle third, down, lower third. Boy, you're really small in here. I already know there's a problem. Okay, so top third, middle third, lower third. I already know there's a problem. Okay, um, thirds, one third, one third, one third. So um, if there's too much room in here, there's a problem somewhere, other midline things. If there's not enough room, like that boy, I already know there's a problem. Um, and with the technology, we could do a lot more of this stuff with photographs or whatever. So even the way to evaluate for sleep apnea, I think would be easier. And then other, other things, uh, comorbid systemic disease. So every patient that has severe asthma, 70% uh, of them have obstructive sleep apnea. So I have a, um, that young man who I told you that was failing school um, went on to go on to CPAP and his puffers, he actually went to college. They were thinking that he wouldn't even be able to you know, leave home he went to college, and he's going to be graduating and super, like, amazingly funny, wicked funny. I, I thought he could do stand-up comedy. His mom is interesting. She has very mild sleep apnea, but she kept getting sick with asthma. Every three months, she's a professional, every three months she would need to go to merge or be on prednisone. I said, you know what, I'd screen you for sleep apnea. And we did, and our AHI on an 8-sat RDI was only 6. I said, I'd put you on CPAP. Um, she has hypermobility. She went on CPAP, and she hasn't been on prednisone in five years. That's why you're important, because you think. Because there's other people that can't do your job. Because... The endocrinologist may not ask. Or brittle, brittle diabetes, that is sleep and hypoxia. But how would they know unless they hang out with me and I don't see them? 
but that patient would come to you. So when I start them on CPAP, I say, be careful of your insulin. It's going to change. You might need less. You're going to have more lows when CPAP starts. Okay, other things. Um, I look for when mom and dad walk in uh, or I'm seeing them, I already know. I can already tell I'm looking for markers of allergy. They say, you have allergies. Yeah. And they say, or I'll say, you used to. How do you know? Because your body shows. Your body tells me what you've lived. Okay. Uh, allergic uh, salute or shiners. This person right here, this is called a Denny Morgan line. It's a marker of ATP. I have it too, uh, but I hide it with glasses. So there's some telltale things. I know that there's systemic inflammation already going on. So there might be dental stuff for sure, but with some of this, between my dental colleagues and I, we trade patients back and forth. Okay, so here, I can already tell you this person sleeps on this side because of the septal deviation. I already can tell you, so this is corrected. Uh, this young man, I'd have to get him to look up, but I already know he doesn't sleep well. Uh, he might even have migraines. This person has more migraines on this side. And I would bet, if I were to guess, sometimes there's tonsil asymmetry as well because of the position they sleep in. Or that person has reflux, tonsillar asymmetry, reflux maybe. And they might not know because it happens at night, but all the literature says, all the studies show that you don't reflux at night. Ask anyone who refluxes, they reflux at night. See, there's some gap between what we think the science shows and what the study shows to the lived experience. And I think science is beautiful, it's amazing. However, there's gaps. There will never be a study for jumping out of an airplane without a parachute and that whether it saves life, our lives or not. If the plane's going down, there's a parachute, I'm taking the parachute. Sorry about the RCT, there's no proof of it, but so what? There'll never be one for hand washing either. We know hand washing is super important, but there's no RCT to say that uh, hand washing matters. Okay, so some of this, look, it, it's important that we be mindful and thoughtful of what the science shows and what we're putting into play in practice, because sometimes there is a gap. Um, this, this is super easy. You see these people in your chair, okay? This is in kids, tonsil size. If the, if the airway's obstructed, two-fold increased risk of OSA. If they're sleeping and you can't, or laying down in the chair, and you can't see the back of their throat, they have OSA. Um, other things, it runs in the family. So once I pick up the parent, I say, okay, who is it, your mom or dad? They're like, hmm. And then, and what about your kid then? Because it's epigenetic. Impacts everybody. So if you're building a practice and it's family-based, once you identify Johnny or whoever, Jane, oh, there's more. There's lots more. The question is, how does it show up? And then they'll tell their two friends and bring them, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it's multifactorial. So I told you, upper and lower airway work together. Um, how are we doing for time? I'm over. Can you give me a few more minutes? Um, so PSG is important, and HSATs can be helpful. Uh, and if it isn't helpful, then you need, um, you need a PSG. However, yeah, you do. You need to talk to someone that knows what to do about it. I really like this for technology. Um, we're, I don't know what the AASM is going to say about it, but it's basically a sleep wing. Who uses this sleep image? Do you guys? Perfect. I love it. It's really great. I think that some of this stuff here is going to be like fingerprint. It's going to classify different sleep disorders in time. I'm not sure. 
so there's, there's colleagues that I've treated where they, we've done all of that, you know, treated the thyroid and put them on CPAP and put them on a mandibular advancement device and done all this stuff and their sleep still looks like that. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what to make of that. We don't know enough about it. So some of this, you know what, it, it's pretty cool. There'll be enough work and stuff to learn for the rest of our lives. But the technology is based on cardiopulmonary coupling and the concordance with an overnight polysomnogram is 98%. I love the technology because you can monitor treatment. You can put them, uh, give them an oral appliance and see the efficacy of it. Um, sorry, I'm running late and taking your time. I apologize. Uh, and, and it tells you other things that we cannot necessarily ma measure in other way. Uh, sleep quality and fragmentation. So going back to that, um, I think I'm going to stop here in the interest of time.